Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good? Did, did you have a good lunch? Good lunch break? Okay, I'm happy to hear that. Our next speaker, he works for Mozilla. He's going to tell us all about what they've been doing in the past, what they are doing now, and what they are going to do in the future. Christian Hellmann. Hello, hello. Okay. I can't hear myself, that's a good start, but I hope you can hear me, so that's good. So um, I'm going to give the same talk more or less that I gave at the campus party in Brazil, which was almost the same thing as here, except it was about half the people who were about 10 times as loud. So it was an interesting thing coming in here and seeing the difference between the campus party there and here. So it's good to see. Also, the wired thing is quite interesting, but at least we have connectivity because there it fell down all the time, which was not good. So <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about a few things that Mozilla has done in the past and how you uh, can be part of this and how it actually, a lot of people don't realize that what we're doing is much more than just releasing a browser and that you actually can be part of all the things that we're doing. And that fascinated me when I started working for Mozilla, coming from a company where I wasn't allowed to talk about everything we do, going to a company where nothing is hidden and can be fascinating because people announce something and it isn't ready yet and I'm the guy who has to talk to the press then like, yeah, this is a code repository. It's not really doing anything else yet. What is a code repository? So it's not that easy. So the web... We actually get tracked by websites about where we are and what time of day it is and these kind of things. But you can actually publish things. The whole idea of commenting on the web, writing a letter to a newspaper before that was quite a job. Nowadays, you write a comment and it's immediately there and you gave feedback and you became a publisher of the internet. And it's for everybody out there. The release process is incredibly simple. I can set up a, a Tumblr blog in like five minutes. I can get an, a, a website really cheap, set up an FTP server, get my stuff up there. It's not hard to do. It's much easier than producing a movie or producing a TV show or producing a CD. And the technologies are, are simple. They're easy to understand. HTML is not magic. It amazes me how many people just don't grasp it, that it's a very simple way of describing what text is supposed to be, not painting with it. And it's not exclusive to experts. It's always fascinating when people say, oh, I'm an HTML expert. That's good, but anybody can be that with the right coaching in a few weeks' time. So you don't have to be the specialist or go to university for years to learn something to be in and on the web. And Mozilla is there for the web. We basically were founded as a non-for-profit to keep the web open for everybody because we saw that benefit. And this was us a few years back. By now, we're like twice the size, so we can't all meet together anymore. But it's just wonderful to meet all these people that go there because they want to do good things for the web, not just for a paycheck or just for a nine-to-five job. 
the interview I had at Mozilla was four hours of the best brainstorming I've done in the last six. just has the, the code on one side and the result on the other side. And it shows you every time there's an error and explains to you what the error was. So instead of asking people to write code from the very start, we give them something that's broken and actually fix, uh, fix it for them and make this world work that before that wasn't really working. And for kids, this is amazing because for the first time, they're like, oh my god, I can fix this. I'm in control. I can do something. And I do the same with job interviews. When I interview developers, I don't ask people to write code. I ask people to fix code. Because most of the time, we, we work with other people's code. And we debug more than we program. So it's really uh, good to know what is broken and how to fix it, rather than like how to build new broken things. We do the same with video. Uh, in video, we got a system called Popcorn. Popcorn allows you to take HTML5 video and remix it with the web. So you have a video file, and you can show a, a map on one si uh, on, in one moment that overlays it over the video. You can sync the video file with text content on the page. And it makes people realize that video with HTML5 is not this black magical box somewhere in the page that you can't touch, but it's just like an image or a paragraph. It's the same as every other HTML element. And you can do things to it. You can style it. You can do really wonderful things with it. And having an editor for it allows people to put like titles in front of their video without having to re-encode it and upload it somewhere or learn an editor. It's rather simple to use. So all of this is incredibly simple. HTML structures content, CSS defines the look and feel, and by now that includes animations and it includes gradients and includes all the wonderful things we had to buy and use Photoshop for. Uh, and JavaScript adds interactivity. That is it. And it's amazing how many people mix and match them all the time and get confused. And I need to know JavaScript to do a website. No, you don't. You can write HTML and a bit of CSS. So you don't even need to know that with a, with a thing like WordPress. These technologies are not hard to do. We just make them hard because we want to show off to each other how cool we are in knowing them. And what we do a lot, and I'm part of this group, is the developer network for Mozilla. So the MDN. Uh, documentation is the only fully open and free documentation for the web out there. So this is all about JavaScript, CSS, HTML, SVG, XML, whatever you want to have there. There is no agenda behind it selling you some tools or selling you some software. There is no agenda behind it getting you to use a certain operating system because we are a non-for-profit organization. And the absolute best thing about it is that it has these report a bug features and also an edit button. So if you find something in there that is a problem or you think this is not well explained and you can explain it better, click that edit button and edit it. It's like Wikipedia. It fascinates me when people complain that Wikipedia is not accurate. Well, there's an edit button. You can make it accurate if you know better. It's there to share knowledge with the world, not to be the one complaining about somebody should do something there. And the, uh, the MDN network has been so long around and has so much good information because people donate their time and just think, I've, I've explained it to myself. I've got to share it with the world now as well. And that's the best way of writing documentation. Solve your own problem and describe how you reached your solution and not just come up with something that you want to describe. So for this, we need you. We need this to be actually up to date. If you find something that's wrong, please tell us about it. Best even edit it and send it to us. And we put it live then, or is live most of the time. But more importantly, we just shifted to a new content management system behind it that we've written ourselves called Kuma. And that one has translations. 
So uh, you can now actually have a you have a button next to it where you pick the language and you can say add translation and whatever language you speak, you can translate the content for the people in your country. And that is sadly enough, or for me confusingly enough, very much necessary. I mean, I'm German. I lived outside of Germany for 14 years, and whenever I write something, people are like, can you get this in German as well? And you're like, you obviously understood it. Why do you want to have it in German as well? So, well, because in German it's better. We had self-HTML and all these cool things in the past, and all of them got outdated so quickly. So translating something that keeps getting updated is a better idea. The interface is really easy. You got the approved English version, and next to it the Portuguese or Spanish or Chinese or whatever language you speak. Can, you can translate these docs for us, and we thank you very much for it, and you, you made the world a bit better by doing that. So even if you're not a programmer, even if you just found something out that you thought was interesting, you can contribute to a lot of programmers what they need day to day. And the MDN docs are not only our website. A lot of IDEs, a lot of uh, tools integrate that content. yet we just had our desktop browser and on
you. As soon as you're in front of people, they will go down. And to me, this is just a start, because it's like, yes, this is what it looks like right now. It doesn't have to look like that in the future. As the operating system itself is HTML, to make a phone that is for your company only, or for senior citizens, or for children, you, all you have to do is write an HTML page. And this is incredible if you think about it. So if you take a look at the source code of Gaia itself, this is the dialer. This is if I go into the phone, well, let's see if it crashes on me because you got a bit of time. Um, if I go on the dialer here on the phone and I want to call a number, this is what it looks like. Let's quickly go to the camera here. I've got a dialer here and I can just call numbers. And every phone, uh, every one of these keys makes a different noise. Good idea. The noise is actually defined in the JavaScript here as the frequencies that you want to have. So if you want to change that to another noise, you can easily do that. You can play a wave file on each of these buttons if you wanted to. And that is Gaia. You can get it on GitHub. You can find the calculator here, the calendar. All the things are just HTML pages with a manifest file and the JavaScript and the styles to actually make them look the way they look right now. And all of this can be tweaked by you. It doesn't have to be, of course. We want you to write apps for Firefox OS, not tweak Firefox OS all the time. But it's still a step towards a mobile experience that is catered to your needs. I could write with Firefox OS a phone that has a different interface when I have a German SIM card in there than when I have my American SIM card in there. And that's not possible with others that easily. Companies could have company phones with three buttons and a logo for their people on the road just doing different things rather than buying an iPhone and then building an app on it and not using the rest of the iPhone or other devices that might be expensive. The apps are HTML and a manifest file that defines the icons and defines what the app is allowed to do. So not every JavaScript can make a call or send a text message. So your app has to actually ask for that permission and the user then says, yes, this app is allowed to send SMS on my behalf. So we need you for that as well. The documentation, again, is on Wiki, is on, uh, is on uh, our MDN. It needs translation, and it needs you to play with it. So have a go at Firefox OS, because this thing can be huge. And it can be wonderful if people like you build something in it. And now is the time to do it. Telefonica are having lots of events going on. They've got money for everybody who wants to have, no, they're not, but <laughs> helping you with all the problems that you have. Again, telephone numbers of those guys later for you. So how do you get started? On the Mozilla Developer Network, there's an app section that explains what these HTML5 apps are. No magic there, much like any other app out there. You can actually simulate Firefox OS on your desktop if you don't get your hands on a phone, which is very hard to do. You can actually just go to your command line and you have a build script right now on, in this case, OS X, where I just do a make run. Uh, make run. And then a lot of like magical green stuff happens and out of a sudden you will have a, uh, an emulator on your operating system, in this case OS X, but we also have them for Windows and for Linux. And uh, yeah, if you want to use those. It takes a bit of a while because my machine is really old and uh, really doesn't do much anymore, but one, two, three, four, five. Out of a sudden I've got a simulator here that runs actually Gaia in my computer and I can see all the things that I showed you on the phone directly in that machine right now and can do these kind of things with it. And that's quite, fu quite funky to do because you don't want to send things to the phone and hope it works out all the time. So uh, I think we're almost there. What about hardware? Open web device sponsored by Telefonica. We're not going to build hardware. We're Mozilla. We don't do hardware, so don't ask us for hardware. We don't have hardware ourselves a lot of times. Because uh, another big company that does a big search engine tried to sell hardware by themselves. That didn't work out, so we thought it's not a good idea for us either. Talk to us, talk about us. There's Butu Gecko on, uh, uh, Butu Gecko is the code name of Firefox OS. Uh, before Firefox OS came around. There's Butu Gecko and MossHacks on Twitter. MossHacks is me on Twitter, but not my personal account, so only official stuff. 
a platform mailing list, an open mailing list again. If you got complaints, it will be obvious in public. IRC on B2G. There's a B2G repository on GitHub. The architecture is defined on the wiki. Gaia repository on GitHub. Developer docs, web API docs, all of that out there. One last thing, if you want to be part of Mozilla and you want to be a guy on stage explaining these kind of things, I'm running the Evangelism Reps training program where I coach people on public speaking and help you out with slide decks and help you out with how to explain things in a simple fashion. So I don't have to fly to Germany all the time. If you want to do something like that, come to me as well later on. I'm helping people out with that because it's always good to share your knowledge. Like, if you are somebody knowing the thing as the only person in your company, you get run over by a truck, the product has a problem. You also have a problem if you try to go on holiday. So sharing the knowledge that you have with as many people as possible makes you safe to actually be on holiday or be run over by a truck. I think the, the former is the better one. So that's all I have. So thanks very much. We have a question there. Do we have a roaming mic? Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. So, uh, I want to ask if there are some main differences between uh, iOS and Android. Do you have some main ideas, some main improvement for building uh, Firefox from iOS? Uh, difference between iOS and Android? And, uh, and, uh, your, your uh, yes, uh, the main difference is that HTML5 is the operating system. iOS, you still have to write in Objective-C or Coco, so, and you have to download the wonderful, really, really small X codes to actually build things with. And uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Boot to Gecko, all you write is an HTML page, JavaScript, and CSS. That's all you have to do. The main, uh, so we neither have Java, nor we have Objective-C, nor do we have C-sharp in there. It's all done in web technologies. <laughs> and, uh, what about limitations? So is, can you expect some limitations for, for example, enterprise, enterprise line applications or something hard? Because when you compile code, you Yes, uh, performance, limitations? performance limitations uh, was the question. If I write native code, I will be faster than writing code that has to go through some conversion. Same way if I build a Formula One car, it's going to be faster than a Golf. But on the normal motorway, a Formula One car will probably not be a good idea. The main difference between HTML5 applications and native applications is that your native application you have to write for each platform over and over again. So when you start with HTML5, you can, in this case, uh, internally, it's, uh, it, the performance is, oh, is very good on, uh, on Firefox OS. On the desktop, we have a few problems in every browser, actually, with HTML5. But the benefit is that you write it once, and you can run it in all the browsers, and you can run it in all the platforms. So using something like PhoneGap allows you, for example, to write HTML5 code and then convert it to, bit, to binary code for the different platforms as well. So you don't even waste the time writing HTML5. You can generate native code from HTML5. You cannot generate HTML5 from native code. Any phone gap questions? There's a few friends of mine from Adobe here that can actually help you with that as well. They also got free Photoshop for everybody. No, they don't, but sorry. <laughs> Another question? Who makes the hardware? Mobile phone providers that sell hardware. I can't say the name right now because we're still negotiating with a few of them. But the phone looks like this, and it's, it's basically quite cute. The Telefonica people can show you some of them. Um, we don't want to say only one provider. We want to make sure we have a few of them for different countries. And it will differ from country to country. Actually, our job is to make the operating system, the hardware, is the same according to, to uh, I mean, Android runs on so many different phones by so many different providers. So we don't want to go into the hardware game to define one phone to rule them all. That's Hello. 
No. <laughs> yes, uh, we haven't thought of that myself yet, or ourselves yet, but uh, tele uh, Telecom Germany actually have a research project that has an Android with VMs running inside it, and they're trying to put Boot to Gecko in these VMs. They did that for the um, for the enterprise market that want to have an Android that is safe and one of them that could be infected by malware. So the main operating system, all the, the, the corporate apps would run inside that VM. So that would be a possibility to run inside that VM as well. And right now, the simulator on the desktop does the same thing. We're not supporting Dart yet because if they want to put it in, it's open source. Have fun with it. Um, the, the, issue, the, the issue is that most of the privacy issues, the leakage that you have on iOS and Android, especially the big one right now in the last few months, was actually social engineering. It was not really a technical problem. It was somebody who actually got hold of somebody's name and address and these kind of things. That the big one that actually managed to wipe all his iOS devices. But the tracking data and giving out information without you knowing is uh, is handled by when you install an app, you ask everything. Uh, you ask basically for uh, for the right to send the data that goes through. So we don't have any background uh, tasks running in uh, in Firefox OS that could send data without you realizing it at the moment. So that's the way we, we're dealing with that right now. There's a few uh, um, a few more things that we're going through in terms of allowing people to log into systems with a system we call Persona, which is actually breaking the thing here. But this is going to be the main. Uh, the main uh, uh, identity system for apps on Firefox OS. So all you give out to app providers is an email address, not the access to that email address, but just the email address, and you don't have to give anything else out. So a lot of the data that is stored in, uh, in Android and iOS will not be stored in Firefox OS, so it cannot leak. I think you should fight it out. Okay. <laughs> no. uh, but w um, are, I think it's great for developers. It's great for, for the industry. But why should a, a, a customer, a regular user, um, choose Firefox OS and not have Android or iOS with hundreds of thousands of apps already uh, on the market? Because they can afford it. The main idea about Firefox OS is bringing it to markets that are too, where iOS and Android is far too expensive. As I said, we don't want to kill iOS and Android. It's not going to happen. But it's, we want to bring the web to people who have no smartphones yet, because they can't afford the smartphones that are out on the market. And we want to make sure that the web runs properly on mobile devices, rather than like being this second-class citizen to native apps that we have right now on other operating systems that shall remain nameless. I, I kind of have two questions. Um, That's OK. Choose wisely. You could want. No, OK, good. <laughs> um, is there any, uh, are you planning any tablet support? And secondly, uh, what about test desktop or laptop similar to like Chrome OS or that kind of stuff? Question was, uh, if do we have tablet support and desktop support? Not at the moment, but we're thinking about uh, tablets. Actually, together with the government in Brazil, we thought about a, a tablet for children. And they want to. They're, they're thinking about what to do right now. And Firefox OS sounds interesting for them. There's a few hack projects. If you look at the Gaia hacking repository, somebody got Bootgecko running on a Raspberry Pi yesterday, which I thought was freaking awesome. And uh, we're, we're focusing on mobile now to get it out. And once we manage to get to do that, we do it more. And personally, I think it should be on everything. Set-top boxes on TVs would be the next big thing, because that's going to be the next big market, because people like to sit in front of their television set. Thank you so much. Can I ask one more? That was the question, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, 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 I work in company uh, which uh, built web applications more than 10 years. And now we um, face the 
the role of HTML layouting. And it's a big problem because we have to test our uh, uh, websites and applications on a lot of browsers. So we have now uh, 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 outstanding position who person who tests all applications in different browsers. So it's the big piece of work for every project. It's so called, it's called web development. We've done it for 16 years. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> mm, uh, what's your uh, position about HTML5 standard? So what position uh, is Mozilla and uh, Firefox uh, hold in this question? Do you support uh, or do you have the lead role here? What, what's about uh, HTML5 standard? on uh, Firefox OS? Uh, well, it HTML5 standard is, uh, the standard defines nothing that um, affects rendering much. The standard defines what a browser should be doing. In the past, the HTML5 standards happened somewhere in a magical laboratory, and then they sent the standards out, and then browser makers did something different. With HTML5, we turned the whole thing around. A lot of stuff that is innovated in browsers and tried out in browsers becomes a standard later on. So both Chrome, uh, Firefox, Opera, Microsoft, we all actually put things into the HTML5 standard. When it comes to uh, the big problem that you said is, is that things look differently across different browsers. This is good. This is not a bad thing. It's like, it fascinates me when people think that a website should look the same on every browser and every device. If you think that, you're sending out JPEGs. You're not sending out uh, uh, websites. A website is a living, breathing construct that actually gives the user the best experience possible on the device that they're looking at. When I got a 1400 resolution, I shouldn't get a 640 pixel text. I should get something else around it. We have to, uh, we have to liberate ourselves from the belief that we could control what end users have out there. People will mess with their font settings, will have or their own CSS styles, some extensions. They will somehow break your website sooner or later. The best website out there actually tests what is possible and makes itself the best experience out there. You cannot just take a, uh, a paradigm of the desktop where everything looks the same on every machine because everybody had the same resolution back then and put it out on the web. There's this and this can run the same app. Do you really want to have the same interface on both of them? And testing means a lot to me. If you write your code right from the very beginning that you assume the worst, and make it better by testing if it's possible and then make it better, then you're fine. If you want to have a three-column layout with perfect pixels next to each other and you wonder when it doesn't work on a device that's this big, but if it turns into a list on that device, great, the end user has something they can use. Give power to the end user out there. And the testing thing, a lot of what you can do nowadays is actually done with virtualization as well. There's a browser storm, there's browser... Um, I don't know the name right now. I, I did a few uh, videos with Microsoft lately about browser testing, and there's lots and lots of good tools where you can actually VNC into other computers and test it out on other operating systems rather than uh, installing everything as VMs on your machines. We have to liberate ourselves from the idea that we are in control with the interface. We're not. End users should get things that work. And if it looks different from browser to browser, great. If it looks the same on every browser and gives everybody an experience that they're unhappy with, not so great. <laughs> I might have been a web developer for too long. <laughs> Hi. Um, will there be an application store similar yes. to... Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> there will be an app store. Uh, Marketplace is open right now for developers. Uh, you sign in with Persona again. You don't have to give us anything else but a Persona ID, and uh, you can upload your, your apps there right now, and we will have monetization and all the things in place once we have partners to do that worldwide with. Hello. How are you going to tackle multitasking? I didn't hear that because there's cheering people. Can you hear it again? <laughs> okay. How, uh, how are you going to tackle multitasking? Multitasking apps. Uh, at the moment, it's the same as an Android. You switch from app to app. You have several apps open. I don't know the shortcut on this phone yet. I could have shown you on the other one. But uh, you, you basically, they hibernate when they're not used and go up again, much like Android does right now. Having to, uh, you just set them to sleep and wake them up. You don't have like two apps next to each other because the screen's just not big enough for it. So every app is its own thread, and the operating system is its own thread as well. So they actually cannot inject each other JavaScript as well. 
Um, at first, I want to thank you for opening up the web um, to these APIs because I think all of these APIs will, um, in the future, uh, leak onto other operating systems. I expect Android to follow and eventually iOS as well and expose these APIs, telephony and everything that's really great. I think that's really a big step for the web. And, and just a small add on question, uh, will there be like background tasks for um, repetitive things or monitoring battery status or something? The battery status is a running uh, is a running threat in Gecko already. So that's in nightly Firefox and in this thing as well. But we won't have background tasks at the moment because we're still looking at the privacy and security of that. Because, uh, yeah, it's great to have a background task that basically pulls my email every five minutes, but I don't know if it's sending my email every five minutes as well. So we're looking much more into, like, uh, what is happening on your phone should be available to you at the moment. And a lot of, uh, I mean, I've, I've written a lot of apps, and I always wondered, background tasks are good for, like, polling in the background, but a lot of times you can do it in one long poll as well. But so it's a matter of, like, what you use. If it's a chat system, maybe... It's a it's a one on one what you need to do with it, but it's quite a task to build properly, and that's why Chrome doesn't do it on the desktop uh, fully yet either. So good. Are we not running out of time or something? <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, connected to this one too uh, because of security. Uh, right now, uh, you don't have a concept of packaged apps and actually installing the app on the device, but you buy the app in, in the marketplace and it is still a hosted app, right? Uh, uh, with a manifest? It is a hosted app with a manifest file, but when it changes, then you have to resubmit your manifest at the moment. Right. So you cannot change the code from under us without the installation process having to go through again. Oh, ah, okay. That's basically the first <laughs> Yeah, that was, <laughs> oh yeah, I put my JavaScript somewhere, give you a manifest file, and then put something else there. No, that's not working that way. We have one last question. Do we? Making it worthwhile, let her walk all the way through the end of the room. Look at that. <laughs> Hi, sorry, like, my question is that, User experience should be consistent, so it's now only about the development and all the guidelines are for the development, but what about uh, from the interface, like guidelines perspective? Is there any ready already or something like that? Yes, we have a, a question was UX, and now it's a developer thing, and like, oh, the icons, I don't like them. Uh, we have a UX team working on the uh, different interfaces that we have. We don't define a UX because that's up to the providers that sell the phones later on. So uh, the Gaia interface you see right now, this was actually built together with Telefonica. Uh, so other providers might have different things. What we're working on with our UX team is, uh, uh, is best practice guidelines of how to implement an interface for it and what the UX for an app should look like to make it most effective. We really, really would like people to join us there as well. This is an open mailing list as well and give us feedback on what we think they're on the right direction because one of the big things of iOS was that it came with really good guidelines on UX. And so we, we're very aware of that and we're very aware that we're developers and we shouldn't do these things. So we actually have a UX team working on it and we, we invite a lot of people coming in there as well. So we're hiring UX people as well. Good hair color, by the way. <laughs> Christian, okay. thank you very much, and please put your hands together one more time. Thank you. Thank you very much.